Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Omar Rafiq, a senior, senior sales engineer with SolarWinds, and uh, shortly, Sean Martinez, also a senior sales engineer, will be joining me. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Phones are muted, questions can be typed into the question and answer tab, and we'll respond as time permits, more than likely at the end of the webinar. Uh, by the way, the session is being recorded and will be emailed out along with slides in a day or so. So let's go over the agenda real quick. Uh, we're going to do a quick brief overview of the SolarWinds um, as a company. We're going to do a compliance and SolarWinds solution overview, then take a look at physical security controls and compliance as well. And then we'll do a SolarWinds compliance product demonstration. And last, certainly, but not least, we'll do a question and answer section. So let's begin with SolarWinds uh, overview. So SolarWinds started back in 1999 as a network management software company. We have expanded our management and monitoring portfolio to include systems and applications, storage, databases, and security provided to government agencies worldwide. You can see some of our impressive results. Over 150,000 customers in 170 countries. Our federal customers include every DOD, civilian, and intel agency. Our IT management software is powerful, affordable, and easy to use. We have a unique approach to the market that has proven to be quite successful. Our mission is to provide purpose-built products that are designed to make IT professionals' jobs easier. We offer value-driven products and tools that solve a broad range of IT management challenges, whether those challenges are related to networks, servers, application, storage, virtualization, databases, or the cloud. So let's do a quick overview with good clients and, and SolWinds as well. Um, the NIST national, uh, the NIST FISMA implementation was created to set guidelines and controls to protect the nation's IT infrastructure. There are standards that are based on mission impact, security standards for data and IT systems, as well as creating baselines for Im implementation and assessment of security controls and making sure that they are effective. Now, although FISMA provides and establishes the security controls, RMF uses those controls in its framework. Uh, organizations identify assets and infrastructure and ensure that the implemented security controls are being adhered to, not only in the IT infrastructure, but also end user policies are being abided by. They must also ensure that the controls and policies are effective and identify any vulnerabilities. Now, we all love the statistics. Uh, and these guides do reduce vulnerabilities. Of course, before you can do that, you need to identify the systems and software so you know which sticks to apply. Uh, monitoring and managing configuration uh, is really important for multiple reasons. You need to make sure that there are no mistakes made in the configuration of devices, as this could lead to exposing your IT infrastructure. And of course, vulnerabilities in the firmware can be exploited by hackers. Now, as I mentioned, that everyone loves running compliance checks and general reports, but what is even more fun are audits. As everyone knows, getting ready for an audit is no small task. Reporting on asset inventories, vulnerabilities, configurations, access levels, and so on requires knowledge of systems and software in the infrastructure. And of course, the reports and data provided must be accurate. So how can all this be accomplished? Solomon provides multiple tools to help organizations in this area. And we'll take a look at them one by one. The Login Event Manager uh, allows you to ingest logs, from syslog from router switches, firewalls. It also gives the ability of, of running uh, reports as far as the stigs are concerned, uh, FISMA, uh, HIPAA. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you're able to uh, do very, uh, using a very powerful correlation engine, correlate data from dissimilar systems, uh, and also provide you with active responses. Uh, so in other words, you can actually set up a response that says if someone did this, then uh, the active response could be shut down a machine, logging them off, getting an email about it, uh, and things of that nature. The patch manager provides centralized patch management, not only for the Windows software on desktops, laptops, and servers, but also third-party software, uh, for instance, Adobe, Apple, uh, et cetera. The network configuration manager provides centralized network uh, device configuration management. But in addition to that, it also allows you to run those compliance reports automatically. 
um, as well as do auto -remedi remediation if that's what you'd like to do. And on top of that, uh, we, using an SCAP API, we connected in this national vulnerability database and are able to identify CVEs that may be applicable uh, to your network devices. We also have the user device tracker. The user device tracker tracks devices based on MAC address. Not only can it track devices based on the MAC address, but it also provides you with switch port history, who logged in, how long they were logged in, what MAC address, and what IP address was assigned to them. In addition, it completely integrates with your domain controller so it can keep track of users, where they were logged in, whether it's a switch port or an access point, how long, and of course, uh, the IP address and MAC address that was assigned to them. The IP address manager provides you with central IP address space um, management, as well as providing you DHCP and DHCP scope management and the, giving you the ability of managing your DNS servers and DNS zones. And of course, we also provide you with uh, or serve you a secure file transfer utility, which provides secure file transfers and file sharing, as well as a, a file server. So in, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about these four products, the Network Configuration Manager, the Patch Manager, Login Event Manager, as well as the Network Performance Monitor, and uh, those will also be the, the de demos that we'll be conducting uh, right after uh, we finish the initial presentation. Now, so we're, we're going to dive into a little more detail on the FISMA control. As we mentioned earlier, these controls are leveraged by RMF, so I guess you could call them RMF security controls as well. So access controls. Both Login Event Manager and Network Configuration Manager can help with access control. For, inst uh, for instance, LEM can detect logon activity that is out of the norm or enable auditing of local or domain user accounts. The SolarWinds Network Configuration Manager not only manages device configurations, but also can, com can run compliance reports at a touch of a button and can also check for form firmware vulnerability, as I mentioned earlier. As far as auditing and accounting is concerned, LEM can send out notifications of any processing fails, and of course, LEM uses time saves from the source to keep track of those uh, failures. The Network Configuration Manager can track and send out alerts on configuration changes, who made them, and what time they were made. With Configuration Management, as mentioned earlier, Network Configuration Manager can run compliance reports using the pre-built templates for uh, compliance like uh, this is Stigs, FISMA, SOX, HIPAA, PCI, and more. And the patch manager and LIM also satisfy some of the requirements, and we'll take a look at that in a little more detail. When it comes to incident response, uh, with LIM's very powerful correlation engine and active response feature, uh, LIM can generate incidents from track data, which can be reported on and stored, as well as an NCM using a real-time change detection feature uh, it will, what we'll do is we'll actually alert you when a change is made on any monitored network device. Who made the change, what time the change was made, and of course, what type of change was, uh, was made and whether it was successful or not. With system maintenance, um, LEM can report on anomalies and logs, and also when something like, for instance, if you want to find out the disk space is getting full. Uh, the network configuration manager can keep track of configuration changes and keep a complete history of those changes as well as require approval before a change is implemented. Lemon also incorporates a media protection feature called the USB Defender, which is a very popular feature. And what it can, this feature can actually detach uh, and disable, or I should say, or disable a USB port based on certain criteria being met. And that criteria can be simply an unauthorized USB device or excessive file transfers. When it comes to security planning, LEM can audit and monitor for patterns and anomalies and logs. And as mentioned before, the network configuration manager can set up an approval system before any change is implemented in the network. As far as personal security is concerned, LEM and patch manager, and to a lesser extent, NPM and NCM and UDT provide tools that can help with the personal security the risk assessment, system and communication protection, as well as system information integrity. Uh, this is STIG and uh, NIST FISMA. Uh, as far as those are concerned, as, you know, we've mentioned this a few times, uh, but Network Configuration Manager provides compliance reports right out the box. Now, the, the reason we've mentioned that so many times is because 
uh, you know, running a STIG report, uh, compliance report against all the configuration in your entire network, uh, be it a small network or you have hundreds or maybe even thousands of devices, can be a daunting task. With the uh, network configuration manager, you, you basically pick which uh, STIG you want to run or which compliance you want to run, click on it. Now, it will run that against all the devices uh, that are matched that, that, that you've selected. It will come up and tell you which uh, have Category 1 violations, which have Category 2 violations, and which have Category 3 violations. And it will also tell you what violations there were, either with a pattern not being found or a pattern being found that, that would make this out of violation and out of compliance, or in violation and out of compliance. Uh, and at that point, you can actually click on that and uh, run a remediation script. Now, once you've uh, run the remediation script, you can go into the settings and to tell the system that if this happens again, please uh, automate, automatically run the script. In other words, auto remediating that particular violation. Uh, LEM is a real-time product that contains a very powerful correlation, as I mentioned before. Uh, now, with the rules that, we, that are pre-built, there's several hundred of them. Um, you can actually set up active response features that happen in real time, which is really important. If somebody's trying to do something malicious or even a mistake being made by an individual, you want to know that know about it as quick as possible, and you want to do some type of auto response. And some of the auto responses uh, that are available to you would be as simple as sending the user a pop-up message on the screen telling them that they're unauthorized uh, to do what they're doing. Uh, or it could be a little bit more, you could log them off the machine. Uh, you can actually disable their account and their domain control so they can't log back in. Or if in a severe instance, you can turn off IP networking on that machine to isolate it uh, so that nothing else happens to the rest of the machines. Or in the extreme situation, you can actually shut down that whole machine. And of course, uh, the Login Event Manager also provides uh, STIG and FISMA as well as other compliance reports um, that uh, you can run straight from the console. Now we've provided you, uh, these slides will be provided as mentioned earlier, so all this will be there for you, but uh, there are some resources um, with uh, some of the, the things that we spoke about, so you can actually access those. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean Martinez, Senior Federal Sales Engineer, uh, to start off the product demos. Sean? Great, great, thank you so much, Omar. Yep, as I mentioned, my name is Sean Martinez. I am the Senior Federal Sales Engineer at SolarWinds. And I've actually been working with these uh, with these products here uh, somewhere between you know, eight plus years here in the company. So as mentioned, we'll be covering uh, the demonstration here. Uh, I'll be covering first off our patch manager, then our configuration manager, our network performance monitor, and then finally we'll be pushing it back or putting back to uh, Omar here uh, for the uh, log event manager. So let me go ahead and first start off with the uh, patch manager here. So we're going to change screens here. So you know, just end the PowerPoint, go into actual products. So the first thing is mentioned about the patch manager, as mentioned in our, our, our security, our PowerPoint presentation in here, is that uh, the, the SolarWinds patch manager has the ability of managing and monitoring and deploying uh, your, your uh, patches. So for any Windows workstation or server, uh, we can, uh, what we do is we interconnect with your WSUS server or SCCM server. So we actually write along with those applications. That way you don't actually have, you're not required to deploy an agent to every single workstation and server. However, you do actually have an agent available to you. That way we can also get some additional information like inventory information uh, and also you know, helping to repair patches, which I'll be going over in a little bit. But really kind of, you know, one of the first big points in our product uh, list was you know, the fact that Patch Manager does have uh, third-party product support. So first thing I wanted to bring up in here is the full list of products. So you all have kind of a short list in here. You see the, uh, the vendors and all the, uh, the products that we automatically do deploy with the patch manager. So these are the patches uh, that we do support. Now this link is going to be always updated so that way you can see when a patch has been uh, updated. What, we're, what we need to note in here is when this was uh, available to the general public through the internet, and then what we uh, denote the date of when it became uh, available within the Solons Patch Manager. Usually our patches, it depends upon the, the, the day, but usually like up to Friday. Most we usually see with a patch turnaround time is 72 to 96 hours for patches. So it's usually very quickly. Now once the patch is within our, our Solons server in here, and this is going to be on your, your Solon server that you have uh, you know, accessible to the internet so that you can connect back to our Solon servers. Now, SolarWinds does have a uh, offline method, so in case a lot of customers do have uh, offline networks where that, let's say you need to air gap this from, a, um, you know, from your internet facing side to a secure side, you can 
very easily export any of these patches and have uh, you know export the data in here so that you can then you know uh, you know, put it on a CD, have it scanned, and then you can move it over into those higher classifications. So there will be ability for you to export and import. Now, with these patches in here, one of the first things to be aware of with the third-party patches is that you'll see there's two types. There's the basic name and then the name with the upgrade in parentheses. The reason why we actually have this in here is so that you can be aware or, or have different flexibilities on how you want to deploy those patches. If there's an upgrade, that means we must make sure that there is a previous version that must exist before that the um, before we uh, install this package. However, if you just install the package by name, we will install it even though there hasn't been a previous version. So you actually do have some rules in here. Uh, there's also the ability for you to go into those packages. That way, let's say you need to denote uh, you know the CVE ID with the system, uh, you know the reboot behavior. Uh, that we can handle all that information. There's also going to be some prerequisite rules to make sure that you know th these are going to be not only applicable to the operating system, but there's going to be some pre and post verifications to make sure this is needed on the system and then verifying it's been installed correctly. Uh, and then we do also have there's a basic uh, you know you can use the silent install option. Uh, oh, let me bring that back up here. There is the the silent install option, so that way you can get those patch, patches. Uh, just you know, for success or return code, uh, but there's also a boot uh, uh, assistant utility. That way, in case we need to do any additional options before we we install the package, after we install the package, I know with like uh, Sun Java and certain vendors, you do need to, to run an uninstall on the the you know based upon the product code or or some information before you install that patch, so you can handle that. You can also handle uh, you know, terminating processes, stopping services, and also starting those processes and services after the package has been applied here in the system. Uh, so let me go ahead and just cancel out of this. So one of the things we also do have mentioned in here is also the ability of automating the patching of the system. So there is an auto-publishing of our, uh, our third-party patches. That way we can deploy them from our Solens patch manager. Over to uh, over to your WSUS or SCCM server. That way, let me see here. Uh, and you can also create your own custom subviews and then actually break out those third-party products. That way, we can see you know patches that are waiting to be approved or needed based upon you know different computer groups. Um, you can you can actually define that in here and get those filtered out. Or you can actually just go into the computers and groups and and do that in here uh, and sort and filter uh, the same same function and options in here. Now, one of the additional features that the patch manager does also include with their patches is that whenever you do uh, deploy and approve patches in their, in your, with your WSUS or SCCM historically, the moment you approve is the moment that it has, it's usually generally available to your, your workstations and servers. So we actually do have a scheduled task system in here so that whenever you want to approve your patches, we can actually set approval, uh, you know, role-based date uh, based upon those computer groups, so that you know what a lot of customers will do is they will deploy maybe their first phase of systems on, you know, you know, Patch Tuesday comes around, so they'll deploy their first phase on maybe Wednesday or Thursday, and then usually phase three or phase, you know, one of the later phases they'll usually start to deploy to the servers, uh, and you can also schedule for that to be, um, you know, kind of more uh, on demand. This also gives you the ability that way, so in case there is, was a bad patch, uh, you know, they've done a quite a number. Of, uh, let's say we need to go back and cancel that, you can just very easily just disable or enable the patch uh, you know, on demand. That way you're not having to you know, go back into WSUS and trying to figure out which ones we need to un unroll. We can just cancel it out from the scheduling system in here. And then, as I mentioned, there is an uh, agent so that you can get some more information from your workstations and servers. So this is just giving us some information about my individual workstations across my systems. So these are just some of the reports I ran in here just uh, before we actually started this call in here. So here we're taking a look at this is you know BIOS information that's being reported from my systems. I can get the ma BIOS manufacturer. Uh, you know what BIOS name or versions installed. You'll notice that I also have taken these fields and dragged and dropped these in here. That way I can actually filter them out, and that way I can get you know all the various versions and what's installed on those various uh, devices. Now, not only is, are we going to be reporting to you, um, you know BIOS information, we do also have a full report system in here, so you can actually update your or check information. So, like patching information, what's installed on the systems. Let me bring this report down here. Yeah, computer information, what group they're assigned to. Uh, here I just ran one for, for printers. 
So I wanted to see all the configured printers that were connect, configured on the system. Maybe we, we you know, remove some server systems. We can see, you know, what, what type of conf printer configuration it is. Uh, as I mentioned, there is going to be the all install programs. So let's say we want to go by publisher. And then you go, maybe go by product name or, or filter for certain names. There's also the ability for you to email, uh, set up email configurations so these can be um, you know, emailed out to you. But then there's also the on-demand export functions. That way, in case you do want to get an Excel spreadsheet or some other options, uh, you can do so uh, within the system. Uh, and then also one of the last things to really kind of touch on with your uh, with your endpoint systems is there's also the we do include a Windows Update remer uh, maintenance and repair utility. Uh, this has been by far one of the the best uh, you know best ways to get your devices back into compliance uh, because let's say that we had a you know bad group policy or something that caused it to, to stop working. Historically, what we had uh, I, I used to do is tell the you know customer bring in your system. We're going to have to back it up, reimage it, and it'll be ready you know in you know three days a week. How long you need to? So this is going to be our, our our last you know kind of step that we can do before we actually tell them we need to bring it in because we aren't getting updates. So we can actually try to reset a lot of the uh, you know, repair utilities, rebuild the in install update. And a lot of customers have actually told me it's been a great way for them to, to get a lot of those systems back up and running. Uh, there's also the on-demand on shutdown and reboot, and also the wake on LAN that you can also set up and, and, and deploy for uh, systems and groups as well. Oh, so I got a quick question on here about uh, for patch management. So what, it says, what is the advantage of using SolarWinds in addition to WSS SCCM native capabilities? So um, really, the the the, uh, the whole reason why we we uh, are adding into the system is giving you that that uh, additional capability of you know uh, better managing your your, um, your your not only the Microsoft patches but also helping you to deploy uh, the patches of especially for WSUS since WSUS does not support any third-party patching whatsoever. Uh, so it definitely does help you uh, within that, that management as aspect. Now with the SCCM server, a lot of customers have also utilized the patch manager product for the sheer fact that we do automatically create the patches and we get them automatically turned around for you. So all you have to do is schedule and deploy them out uh, to your devices. So we help you to simplify that process. Now the only co screen I don't have in here on our demo right now is the SCCM console. But one of the things to just be aware about is that we, if you do have an SCCM uh, application console already, we actually do add a Solens patch manager tab on the left side so that you can actually get all the same third party uh, options and accessibilities in there as well. So you can either use this native console we have on uh, that you can run locally on your server or locally on your workstation, or you can also utilize that, that SCCM option as well. Oh, uh, question asks, asks is, is uh, Patch Manager a standalone application? Yes, it is. Uh, it is a standalone application for the, uh, uh, out of all the Solens products. Now, one of the things to be aware of is that uh, we also do have, um, and I'm going to be taking us into one of our other screens in here, since we're going to be going to one of our other products, is that uh, the Patch Manager does also have a web console tab within our Solens Orion web console. And this is where our next two products that we'll be going into is our our network configuration manager and the network performance monitor. So we can actually combine and report the patches of your servers and workstations in our patches tab and have it report on this web console. Now just be aware that what we're doing is right now this is just a reporting aspect. So this is going to let us know what uh, patches we have uh, available and deployed or uh, is missing on per server or per workstation. So we will be able to give you that information. But one of the things to just be aware about is that this does automatically connect, uh, correlate back to the Orion core node devices. So if you do have a server that you're managing patches or deploying patches, you'll still be able to see the patching history within the node details page uh, of this console. OK, great. So um, I'll, I'll be taking some of the other questions later here. But uh, I'll go ahead and just ch change. Uh, uh, you know, we'll be finishing up here with the patch manager. So the next product we'll be going in here is the the network configuration manager. So now that we've just covered, uh, you know, systems and applications, uh, you know, now we're going to be going over uh, managing your uh, network devices for uh, the configurations and also checking to see uh, about the compliance about what's in and what's missing out of the configuration. So the configuration manager does have um, the ability of, of managing any 
um, router switch, firewall, really any device that has CLI-based access, we can tell that SSH into, and whether it is a scheduled job, we can download that configuration. We also do have on, on our console, we can also go under a device. You can always, uh, under like configuration management, or if you select it on a device uh, in, in the no details page, you can also just select any device and select download configuration. Uh, there's also going to be the ability for you to also execute or make changes to those configurations as well. So that, that way we need to make like small script changes, like maybe we need to enable syslog or change SNMP community strings, or maybe enabling NetFlow on the system. You can do it all from the web console in here, but there's also auditing capabilities that are automatically built in. Uh, because whenever you do deploy of uh, device the configuration changes, you can set um, different approval authorities or different uh, role-based access for your users so that before they are able to actually, the, our product is able to actually go out and touch and make those configuration changes, a manager can go through and, and you know, see, first off, what users submitted the configuration, when the configuration was submitted, when they are looking to make this request change, whether it's immediate, uh, you know, scheduled or, you know, be sent back to them whenever it's been approved. And then what devices are going to be, uh, you know, are we going to be affecting? And then as the manager, the manager has the ability of editing and viewing the configuration so they can actually add or remove devices from the list, make configuration changes, and if it's exactly the way they want to, they can approve it or just straight out decline it. Uh, and then as I mentioned, they can always just, you know, there's, there's three options of scheduling, executing immediately, or sending it back to the technician. Uh, letting them know about those those issues. Uh, now, this the configuration manager does also include a, a syslog a, and a sol, uh, SNMP trap receiver server, so we can also listen for uh, listen for what we call real time change detection. So, with uh, your network devices, usually when someone logs into the device directly, and makes a configuration change. They usually send a syslog or trap message, which we can actually uh, listen for. And then from there, we can automatically SSH, telnet into the device, download that configuration, compare it against either your last downloaded configuration or a baseline configuration that we've set or that you've personally set within the system. And so whenever we see some sort of variable change, we can let you know about that change. We'll color code it, red, green what's new, what's been removed, what's changed will be in yellow, and then we'll give you, uh, it's usually by default like five or ten lines as a context. Uh, you can also go into our settings to uh, set, ignore certain rules, uh, also adding or removing certain context. And as I mentioned, you can also set and clear baselines. Uh, that way you can you know, set specific configurations instead of just your last one in here. And then we'll go ahead and, and you know, send email notifications about those. So we make that quick reporting. Uh, now, there will also be full reporting for you to also just select whether it's the same device or two different devices for configuration history. So if I select a device and I say I want to compare the configurations, I can compare the, the running and startup. Now, you can also you can compare selected configurations, but you can also select based upon a date timestamp. That way we can show you versus every you know, real-time change detection or scheduled configuration download when those changes did occur, and then you can get that information in a full-on report uh, ad hoc, or you can schedule that out as a, as a job. Um, now, some of the other things just to be aware about with our configuration manager is that we do store all the configurations indefinitely by default, and then you go into the jobs and you set that to purge based upon the number of configurations or date timestamp, or you can just go in there manually and delete them in the, as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is role-based access, so you can limit those uh, to make those changes. And then really kind of the last big area of this product in here is uh, we're covering over is the compliance report. So since we already uh, you know, store your device configurations, our compliance policies or reports are designed to let you know what is in the configuration that should not be there or what is lacking in the configuration that is supposed to be there or, you know, across all, or all, some, or a few devices. So we, we ship with over 50, uh, 50, 55, 60 reports in the system. 55 will be disestig reports. Uh, by default, we have Brocade, Cisco, Palo Alto, uh, and, and I believe Juniper. And then you can also just very easily modify these. Uh, and there will be some additional ones you can also download from our form site uh, and, and get those available. And then, as mentioned, you just uh, you can run these against all of your devices. And then what happens is that you can, we will color code this so we will let you know um, by default, we do informational, warning, or critical. 
You can also rename these as your category levels, one, two, and three. But then whenever you see that issue, you can click on, well, why is this device in warning? So we click on this. We have, first off, the configuration name. So we can click to view the configuration. So I can do that in the new tab. Here we have the rule name. So that's the top column of the name here for disable IP. The number of devices in violation. So we see that there's currently 19 devices in violation. And then there's a remediation script option in here. Now you'll notice that this one is a regex expression for checking to see that this, you know, something was not found in the configuration. But you can also do that basic text pattern matching. And you can also use and or operators. You can search the global configuration or specific configuration set of the configuration. So you can get um, you know, very basic very, uh, or get very advanced and very granular if, with these if you need to. Now as I mentioned, there is this remediation script option. So you can actually either A, you can, you can prepare the configuration uh, script so that whenever we find this, we can execute it on just this device, execute this on all devices in violation. And then we do also have under our settings the ability of automatically, autonomously making those configuration changes based upon what the report has found. Uh, by default, we run these reports every 11, 11.30 at night. Um, you know, so you know, 23, 23, 30 at hours, you'll be seeing those reports ran. But you can also go under our settings and change those to be uh, for what you want to do, and then also turning on or turning off that, that that automation of making those configuration changes. Uh, and then really kind of one of the things to be aware of in, in the summary screen, so we'll let you know about basic device information, what devices we backed up, did not back up. Uh, let's say that we are seeing a conflict between the baseline and the running configuration, or one of the most basic ones in here. Someone forgot to commit the running configuration. So these are now interactive charts, so we can get get to see what the devices are that we're, we forgot. You know, either we did not back up successfully, or there is actually a co uh, conflict between those. So here we could go select the device, and then you could just do download configuration, and then you could check to see was you know it, was there truly a conflict between those devices. And then one of the last points I just skipped in here was uh, firmware vulnerabilities. So right now, the firmware vulnerabilities function is only available for Cisco devices. The reason is because we're currently just checking against the Cisco iOS image details uh, from the device. Um, so what we do is we'll actually go out to the NIST.gov website. We will check based upon their, uh, their vulnerability XML CVE system for uh, you know, for the vulnerabilities for your Cisco devices based upon the iOS image. And then if we do find a, a vulnerability, we first flag it as a potential vulnerability. And then from there, you can say, you know, yes, we've confirmed it is vulnerable, or no, it's not Apple to the system. Now, if it was vulnerable, then you could say, well, we have remediation plans, or we've already remediating it, or we're planning to waive this system. And then you can select just, you know, select a number of devices. That way you can keep all that information, you know, locally here within the system and get that reported. Uh, also, one of the last areas in here for compliance uh, that kind of also kind of uh, real quick coverage too is end of life, end of sales, and support, end of maintenance. So you can actually have a database in here. Uh, we do try to we ship this with a product uh, and give you suggestions based upon the machine type and models, uh, and then give you those suggestions. If they've not been found, you can still just assign dates and then keep that information tracked historically in here. Um, that way, we can give you alerts and reports about those devices that are ending in support and letting you know about those issues you know, before, um, you know, before they run out of contract. Okay, so one of the things that I also mentioned is the fact that you know the, the, the configuration manager does also have uh, the ability of you know, whenever you click on the device from the configuration manager, uh, it'll take you into our, our node details page. So this is actually showing us a, a full encompassing view of not only the, the, sol the uh, network configuration manager, but really all of the network monitoring and, and management modules of this console. So we'll have both the configuration history and also our next product that we'll also be covering, our network performance monitor. The reason why I'm kind of mentioning this now is because of the fact that you can kind of see we've correlated this and integrated this all together. That way, whenever we see performance issues, you can then click on the configs tab, which is on the left side in here. That way, you can then incorporate and view all the configurations, see what the vulnerabilities are with this device, view our policy violations. Uh, you you can ad hoc download a configuration or execute a script. Change those, uh, you know, check the, the configuration change all from the node details. Uh, and then there's also upload configuration in case you do want to save a uh, you know, additional like you know, running start type of config uh, internally into our database. So it makes that pretty simple.
So as I mentioned, that you know the next part that we are covering in here is the network performance side. So this is tracking, uh, you know, what is actually going on with your your infrastructure, whether it is network, server, UPS, print server. Really, the network performance monitor does truly support any device that is IP enabled, uh, because at the very least, it will be letting you know, you know, first off, is that device up and available, but then through whether it's SNMP access. WMI or our SolarWinds Windows agent that we have available, we can you can deploy to see whether the, the systems are up or down, uh, CPU, memory, interface statistics, and volume utilization as well. Now with the system, we'll actually get we color code this so you see whether the device is up or down. But then there's also going to be that the the mouse over ability so that you can mouse over on systems on information. That way you can go in for more uh, reach for the most recent performance data before you actually go into uh, device details page. And that's going to be on any page of our web console, whether it is uh, you know in our, our summary pages, our, our details pages, we'll automatically give you most recent uh, performance information on this module. Now, some of the other additional options that are also included with this, oh, I'm on the main module in here. Let me jump over to our network. The network, uh, network performance monitor does also add some additional functions for uh, you know, sp uh, specific information in here. Uh, so for, uh, for your Cisco devices, we will track multicast information, VLAN information, VRF information, and multicast group information. Uh, now, with the multicast, we will report to you in case that there's a uh, multicast being added or removed, packets per second drops to zero, uh, and then VLANs will just report to you all the VLANs that are associated per device, and you can also get that uh, reported back in, into here and, and identify uh, those issues. Now, one of, the, one of the systems in here, let me kind of bring it up. We also mentioned that you know the, the, the network performance monitor, one of the, one of the first points in our, our compliance features list was the fact that we do uh, you know, trend utilization for capacity planning. So in one of our most recent versions, we've included capacity planning for CPU, memory, interfaces for interface utilization, interface errors and discards, volume utilization, so that we can trend out to you how many hours, days, weeks, months, or one year or longer it takes until we see a, a those selected resources go into a warning, critical, and that capacity, which is 100% utilization. So you can now go individually per interface, per, per uh, you know, CPU, per device, or whatever, and you can now define your own custom warning critical thresholds. That way, whenever you define them in our product per device, it then automatically does apply to the capacity planning. It also does help us to simplify your alerts as well, so that you know historically a lot of customers were doing you know alert me whenever CPU utilization for some devices were over 80%. Now you can just say, alert me whenever the CPU utilization is in warning or is in critical. That way, in setting, set, setting maybe 10, 20, 30 alerts, you're then just basically setting you know, maybe one, two, three alerts uh, for these issues, since you're now defining it per device, per interface. Okay. And then, as I mentioned, one of the other big uh, other information here is also checking uh, network health and network availability. So you know some of the basic information that the network performance monitor is doing by default is schedule-based polling for performance information. So we're automatically collecting and, and um, this information once every two minutes by default for status, once every ten minutes for statistics like CPU memory interface data, and then we're tracking all that information for one year by default. And you can always change and tune those to be more often or faster if needed, slower if needed, or you can collect and keep the information two, three, five years or longer if, you, if you'd like to. Now, whenever you select on a device, you'll always see the radial gauge denoting to you the most recent information that we pull from the device. And then there's going to be a historical chart showing you that historical information. The charts will be interactive, so you can click and zoom for any specif uh, specific time period. There's also going to be an export button over at the top right. And then the, the gauges will also be interactive, so if I click on this chart, uh, the gauge, it'll then take us to a chart, so that way I can actually uh, export the real information uh, if I click on raw data, it'll export an Excel spreadsheet. If I click on chart data, it'll actually give me the information in the browser based upon the date timestamp and then the output information. So it makes it really simple so that you can very easily pull back any of this information uh, in detail uh, from our product. Now there's also going to be the ability at the top right of every page, the ability of exporting to PDF. But then there's also a, a report scheduler, so you can also schedule to have any page emailed out to you, saved, or printed out uh, 
yeah, email saved or printed out for you uh, on a scheduled uh, rolling basis for you. And speaking of that, because that's also one of the other points in here is, uh, you know, giving you information about uh, audit tracking about uh, information. So one of the things that we built into not only the network performance monitor, but the configuration manager we just uh, talk, spoke of earlier, is that it does have audit capabilities. Uh, so under our message center, we will have show audit events. You click on apply, and then based upon the time, uh, time period and how many messages, it will show us the history of devices being added or removed, alerts being added or removed or changed, uh, polling settings, times, um, you know, any views that have been modified, and then giving you that information to the users. Okay. And really the last real major data point to cover on here with, with compliance is that there is also a feature within the uh, the network performance monitor called quality of experience. So everything I've been showing you within the network performance monitor so far is, is basically in a communication from the Solon server out to those network devices and back for performance information. So it's a little bit different about the quality of experience is that this uses agents to let you know about those, uh, about protocols and protocol latency. So with the agents, you can deploy to workstations or you can do a port spanning on a switch port and then select the protocols and the endpoints you want to monitor. Now this is looking at all end user information. So this is not simulated information. This is showing us what we're actually seeing going across the network links. And what's breaking out in here is trying to under help us to understand our network latency delays or what we're denoting in here is our network response time or the TSP handshake time frame. And then there is the server application or endpoint device uh, latency delays. And that's what we're denoting under the application response time or the time to first byte. So the reason is, is so that we can do a, quite a few things with these protocols. First, and I'll scroll down to the bottom in here. You have different ways of segmenting out what you consider the traffic to be on your network. Is it social? business, a mix of the two, and these are interactive, so if I click on these, it'll, it'll just show us just the protocols specific to the, that productivity that you selected. Same thing with the risk level, so you can say whether it's you know safe to be on the network. Same thing with traffic category. Now, the reason why we have all this mix, uh, you know, mismatch of what's safe versus what's not safe on the system is really twofold, really for you know, the network engineers and the sysadmin alike, because the network engineers are trying to identify you know, what's being sucked up by your protocols, but then also helping you to understand what, what you should do for your QoS settings. And then the server and application team can also do like, you know, break out that same information, uh, you know, helping to, you know, help prioritize their, their applications. Or just identifying, is it just maybe, you know, maybe it's a mobile device that's truly just having that delay and not their application. So one of the things that we have in here is that, so that, you know, when, whenever we see that average, oh, let me go back here real quick. So you can just understand how this chart's reporting information real quick. So the chart information at the top in here is showing us the last 24 hours. So what this is saying is that this protocol, FTP, the average for 24 hours was three seconds, the peak being 13 seconds. So I'll go ahead and click on this application for, or protocol for more information. Now whenever you click on the, the protocol information, this will show us your uh, category risk level. But you also notice that there's also going to be showing us data volume and transactions. Now this is the only there's only two commonalities between our one of our other modules, NetFlow, and this product, which is going to be your data volume of how much data was being sent and the protocols. Other than that, NetFlow and this this, this uh, feature in Network Performance Monitor is going to be very different because of the fact that it is giving us uh, the latency information of the protocol and helping us to identify that endpoint device. Now, one of the things that we automatically do have in the system is so that whenever you are monitoring your servers and you're, you're monitoring all of your routers with their interfaces along those paths. One of the things we've automatically added in our product is the network topology a few years ago. So since I found that this was a network latency going back to the server, you know, I clicked into the server for performance details. Well, you know, if I clicked on that without having that performance information, I would have first worked on to figure out why is this server having performance problems, but I knew just a moment ago it was a network latency. So I'm going to jump mouse over for this interface. It's reporting saturated. Same thing with the other side. So I'm just going to jump straight over to this endpoint device, which is actually showing high latency and some packet loss. So we'll go into here, and then we'll go into that device's details page. So you can kind of see how you can kind of working through a troubleshooting process, not having to go back to the summary screen. You, you can kind of go 
I always say kind of through the rabbit hole to go into more more information because anytime you do see a device status red green that means there's going to be a link taking you to that device for more information so since I clicked on the router this is a Cisco router so we can actually have uh, route changes so we see the right was a route added roughly about 13 hours ago and someone that made this change accidentally looks like they had some issues because uh, the RIP protocol is now having some uh, interface flaps on that destination. So I could either a, you know, I can find that destination there. It's one three one two. So I can, you know, I can go up, go into the configurations, or add the device into the configurations, download those to see what the changes were, uh, or I can kind of go down into here. We also do have a route neighbors and a routing table uh, information that will also be tracked in here, so we can get all that information in the system. So uh, let me see here. So I pretty much covered the the uh, more performance monitor. So I'll push this back over the uh, to Omar here, so we can cover the log event manager before we kind of finish off with our questions here. Okay. Well, thank you, Sean, for that uh, great presentation. Um, we, I'm going to go ahead and quickly go into the log event manager. Uh, so the log event manager is actually a, a virtual appliance. It comes with the uh, database as well as the operating system built into the system. They're both hard and there's no access from the outside, although there is a limited uh, accessibility to the CLI, but again, it's not to the root operating system, it's just to the, the device itself. I'm going to quickly go over some of the features. Uh, this particular screen that we're looking at uh, is the live monitoring. I mentioned live monitoring uh, because uh, it's actually doing this in real time uh, in memory before it gets written to the database, which is very important. This is all the events that are happening. If you want to get more events information about any one of these events, you can just click on it, and down here in the lower left-hand corner, or I'm sorry, lower right-hand corner, you'll see all the information regarding that particular event. Um, now, these events can be coming from uh, router switches, firewalls, uh, any network devices using syslog, as well as uh, operating system log, event logs, uh, databases, uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, and a virus software, and all this data can be correlated. If you needed to filter something out, uh, and wanted to see, uh, identify some spe specific event, you can just go ahead and use any one of the filters that we've created for you, security, IT operations, change management, authentication, import monitoring, or compliance. Um, or uh, you can also create your own filters. Uh, let me just verify that uh, everybody's listening to my audio. OK. Um, and once you've created a filter, uh, you can modify the filter to be more very specific if you'd like to. And we're gonna, I'm going to bypass the actual creation. I can show that to you uh, in the, the next feature, or actually this feature after this. There's also a historical analysis as well. And uh, I'm getting messages that uh, my audio is not working, so I need to verify that. OK. Um, so uh, as we have a tool called the Explorer in-depth feature, and that's historical analysis as well as forensics. This will allow you to search for a very specific event, uh, whether it's uh, the last hour, the last week, or a custom date. Uh, by default, it does the last 15 minutes. Uh, but you can, you can set the date. Uh, and you can create very in-depth um, searches and very powerful search engine. Now, I'm kind of skipping over this and concentrating more on the um, here. I am still getting messages that I, no one can hear my audio, so I want to verify that first before I go further. Okay. Um, so uh, the rule uh, creation that, as I mentioned, uh, this allows you to set up a rule where, based on certain criteria, uh, an auto-response uh, act action can take place. Uh, these rules are based on activity types, authentication, change management, compliance, device monitoring, endpoint monitoring, IT operations, security. Just to give an example, if you were looking for suspicious activity on the network, you would, and, and by the way, there's several hundred rules built into the system. You could modify any one of them, or you can create your own rules, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, if you want to look monitor for suspicious activity, for instance, uh, we'll show, show you there's a bunch of uh, different activities here. You can select any one of those. Or you can actually take the template, which uh, here's a kill suspicious process, and we can clone it. And by cloning it, uh, you are able to uh, modify that particular activity uh, or the particular rule. Uh, the way it would work is you have the correlations. You have a correlation time, 
and actions. So in this case, we're saying that the process start image file equals this pattern, and the process start image file does not contain save processes, uh, then this rule will fire. If you take note, this is a group, uh, and within you can create additional groups if you wanted to, and each group has a Boolean operator. It's this, it's this bar here. Currently, it's an AND. If I just click on it, it becomes an OR. I wanted to stress this because there's absolutely no script writing at all. Everything is done with this drag and drop uh, functionality. So if this, this correlation or this criteria happens within this correlation time, take this action. In this case, it's kill the process by name. So you can certainly do that. If you wanted to add additional actions, you can come down to the Actions tab. Uh, and let's say at this point, we probably want to get an email sent to somebody. Uh, and you would select the template. Templates, uh, we have several built-in templates for you. And the templates basically format the message uh, of, the, of the, uh, the email message that's going to be sent. You also select which users. Uh, and it can be a group of users or multiple users. Um, and then, and in this case, uh, this particular template has two variables that can be pulled out of the logs and inserted into the uh, message body. But of course, you can add additional variables here uh, by modifying this template. In this case, we'll just leave them as is. We'd also send a pop-up message to the user on their screen, telling them that they're unauthorized uh, to start this process up, or it's an, you know, it's an unsafe process. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we can log off the user at that point. Uh, we could make sure that they don't get back into the system by disabling uh, their domain control, uh, their account in the domain controller. And in the worst case scenarios, uh, we can actually go ahead and disable networking on that server so that uh, that isolates the machine. And of course, ultimately, we can shut down the machine. And as you can see, you can do multiple of these, and it'll do it in this order. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, what we're doing right now is we're actually editing this particular uh, this particular uh, rule. And we can certainly go ahead and rename it. Uh, we also give you a test function. What the test function allows you to do is it allows you to run these correlations without taking any action, just in case shutting down machine was one of your actions, um, and you wanted to make sure that you were not too vague in this uh, correlation part. Because if this is too vague, you may unintentionally shut down multiple machines. So you can actually select the test, go ahead and do the correlations, um, and then once uh, once this rule is fired and you're uh, you're sure that it's working. You can untest it. You can check on that by going to the monitor section and looking under rule activity. As you can see, one rule has already shut down. You can see here the agent offline early shift two has fired, um, and it tells exactly what it's going to do, and it's just sending an email. That's all it's doing. Um, but of course, if um, uh, if you see that the correlation is working and the rule is uh, firing correctly, then you can go back to the rule uh, and then uh, to uncheck the test, and you're good to go. Um, so uh, we are uh, there's uh, you know I, uh, there's quite a few other rules as I said several hundred rules built in. Uh, let me go over. I'm going to cancel out of here and show you some more of these rules. Um, and you can see that under activity types, uh, you can click on activity types. There's administrative monitoring, database editing, auditing, end user monitoring, file auditing, inappropriate usage, network process. Remember we mentioned the USB Defender. If you want to go to USB Defender, you can say uh, detach unauthorized USB Defend. Detach USB based on excessive file copies. Detach USB file executed. Detach USB infected devices. And uh, uh, USB Defender service stopped. So these can all are rules that can be um, modified and, of course, uh, alerted on as well. There's authentication, which will take care of a lot of the access controls uh, rules that we were talking about. There's change management. The compliance tab. Uh, the compliance tab will have uh, different Categories: This is Stigs, Gilbug, uh, HIPAA, uh, NCUA, NERC, PCI stocks, as well as general best practices. There's device monitoring, uh, everything from antivirus all the way down to VPN and remote access in Windows machines. Uh, endpoint monitoring, general best practices, IT bit operations, uh, database, general best practices, and server, and of course security. We've just a quick look at. So you have all these options. Uh, again, you can create a rule from scratch by just adding, hitting this plus button and creating a rule completely clean. And uh, to create a rule is very simple. You just go to the events, pick your event. Uh, let's say you want to look for files being deleted. You just go up here and type in file, take the file delete, drag it over here. And now any monitored system where a file gets deleted, you get notified. And of course, each of these fields, each of these uh, events have fields. So if you want to be more specific than any file being deleted, you can literally go through here and stick the file name. And uh, we can just put exe. Star exe. So that means any file that was an executable that gets deleted on any monitor system will get deleted. 
at what you get notified. And you can keep adding additional criteria here uh, to make this more specific. Now, one other thing you can do is instead of putting a specific file name here, of course, if there was multiple files, you could put multiple lines here. But instead of doing that, you can certainly go to the user defined groups uh, and create a, uh, a group of files, uh, maybe called sensitive files, and just drop that group in here. And we have a bunch of groups already built in for you. So now any file that's part of the sensitive files group that gets deleted on any monitor system, you'll know about it. And of course, you could put time and, and uh, source account, you know, do it machines and IP addresses, whatever the case may be, and make this more specific. Uh, we have a few minutes left over uh, as we're running uh, a little bit short on time. Uh, so what I'd like to do is go ahead and uh, open it up for some questions. And uh, let me go back to our chart here, uh, presentation. Okay. So there's quite a few questions coming in. Um, since uh, due to time restrictions, as we're going to go over a little bit, uh, we will answer those questions in uh, subsequent emails. I'll just take a few questions right off the bat. Um, the first question that come, came in uh, is, let's see, it says here, uh, can, you, uh, can you limit access to the LEM console? Uh, and I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, access to the LEM console uses a set of different roles that could be used for limiting the visibility and ability to make changes within the LEM system. Um, and by the way, you can also use Active Directory uh, with the user and group integration to ensure no one, uh, no out-of-band users are being used. Um, and uh, the LEM data store only supports write access from internal applications uh, using credentials and connection details that are embedded in the application itself. Uh, and, that, and neither one of those are editable or accessible. Uh, and external access database, uh, as I mentioned, is, is hardened, so it's, it's only read-only. And that also can be limited by IP address um, by the administrator uh, in the, the shell itself. Uh, we have time for one more question. And that question is, uh, it says, um, are there any, uh, is it auditing? Uh, is there any appliance auditing or self-auditing? Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. So detailed auditing of all the appliance activity is enabled by default. Uh, and that includes uh, that, that both in the logs as well as the reports. Uh, this includes any changes the rules to, uh, to the rules. If somebody makes a change to the rule, to the report, to the filters, if they do a search, uh, if any of the widgets get changed or any internal elements, uh, there's access auditing as well. So any successful or failed attempts to access the web or the reporting tool uh, will be audited as well as any rule activity. So if a, full, if a rule fires, it's going to create a full audit trail of the actions taken. Um, if anybody runs a report, um, the, there's, that's all audited as well and logged. Um, and of course, if any does a, runs a search, as I showed in the, of the uh, forensics, um, it gets included, and that includes the source IP address and the username as well. Uh, so that will uh, conclude at this point the webinar. Um, for those of you, I see lots of questions here, and unfortunately we've run out of time. Those questions will be answered. Um, in uh, a follow-up email. And as I mentioned before, you will also get a copy of the slide deck in a few days. So I really appreciate everybody uh, joining us. And um, I, I want to thank everybody for joining. And we will see everybody in the near future.